Good afternoon. Welcome to Let's Talk Gardens, a weekly webinar series sponsored by Smithsonian Gardens that will introduce you to topics to turn your brown thumb green. Today though, we're talking about a different aspect of gardening, an aspect on how we archive our America's gardens to make a difference in future understanding of what we're doing in trends in America's gardens. My name is Cindy Brown. I'm the Education and Collections Manager at Smithsonian Gardens. And we, you are in for a treat today to learn more about how Smithsonian Gardens works with the Archives of America Gardens and what a difference it makes to what is known about past and future gardens. So a bit of housekeeping first. Please put your questions in the chat box. We are not going to honor raised hands. Uh, we're not gonna uh, call on you to raise your hand to ask your question. Just please put your answers in your chat box. The chat box is easy to open on your bottom of your screen. You'll see a box that you can click and it'll open it. You can also change the presentations view between speaker and gallery. Most of the time you're just gonna see the speaker which is Joyce Connolly. But at the end, I'm gonna come back on and I'm going to share your questions that are in the chat box with Joyce and we'll be glad to answer them after the presentation. Also, for the optimal quality for your presentation today, please ensure that all other browsers except for this one are closed and then you'll be able to see the great quality of the pictures today. And if you notice, if you joined us before, I have a different image behind us. This is one of our glass lantern slides that's in the archives of American Gardens. Beautiful. So sit back, relax, and you're going to enjoy this wonderful collection of slides. Before we do anything else though, I'm gonna introduce the speaker and then we're gonna put up a poll again. Joyce wants to know, what do you know about glass lantern slides? So we've created several questions to be able to gauge your knowledge of glass lantern slides. So Joyce, welcome to our presentation today. And thank you for telling us about this terrific subject. Thank we you, learned Cindy. about photography yeah. last week, the brand new digital. This is not. So I think they're gonna get a real good view. What do you think? No. This is old school photography, and uh, I hope you enjoy what you'll be uh, seeing today. But uh, Cindy, do you want to uh, start the poll now? I will. So let me start up the poll. And as Cindy says, this will be to gauge uh, what you might know about uh, glass lantern slides. Great. So it's up on there now. Uh, you're welcome to vote and let us know what you know about glass lantern slides. And Joyce, while they're voting, uh, I want you to tell us more about who you are and what do you do at Smithsonian Gardens? Yes, uh, I'm Joyce Connolly. I'm a museum specialist with Smithsonian Gardens. And basically uh, that means I'm tasked with uh, taking care of the collections uh, that Smithsonian Gardens manages. And I've been here about 20 years. I do wanna qualify my, my remarks today by saying I'm not a garden historian. I am not a photography historian, but uh, what I am uh, sharing with you today is what knowledge I've, I've learned over the years with working with this collection. So I hope that uh, you do come away with uh, some new information um, uh, that I'm able to uh, relate today. So Terrific. Cindy, how is the poll coming along? The poll's going on great. We almost have every, we have 73% of people that voted. So I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll and then share the results. So the, how many layers of glass does a typical glass lantern slide have? Are they right, Joyce? It looks like 53% say two layers. Uh, that is absolutely correct. Uh, so about half of you got that right. That's and terrific. the next one was a bit of a stumper. What is the um, uh, standard size of a glass lantern slide? And actually that is uh, three and a quarter by four. Uh, so about a quarter of you got that answer. And uh, the last one, Cindy? Mm -hmm. 
the what device is needed to properly view a glass lantern slide. And I made this one up, Joyce did it. So I wanted to see if you knew uh, the special way because glass lantern slides and Joyce will show you look really different when you're just holding them in your hand compared to how they're actually were meant to be shown. So was it a magnifying glass, a digital projector, a Kodak projector, remember those, or a magic lantern? So Joyce, the choice was a magic lantern. Is that correct? That is correct. Uh, yes. So about half of you got that. So uh, about half of the crowd um, has a good understanding and the other half I'm uh, hoping is going to have as good an understanding after this uh, lecture is finished. So I know they will, Joyce. So I'm going to stop sharing this and I am going to disappear, but take them on a magic lantern trip. Thank Here we you, go. Joyce. Thank you. And um, okay, uh, you'll have to forgive uh, this title, but uh, it's early garden photography, hand tinted glass lantern slides, and my subtitle was "What a difference a die makes." So, uh, sorry for the pun, but after this is over, you'll get a better sense of why I ended up with that. Uh, I'm going to be going over uh, hand tinted glass lantern slides and just to give you a rundown of what we're going to cover is a little bit of historic background about lantern slides, their material characteristics, uh, some of the informational clues they might provide or, or, or lack, and then uh, end up uh, specifically talking a little bit about the glass lantern slide collections at the Archives of American Gardens. And um, specifically, uh, we've got uh, a number of collections in the archives that um, have lantern slides in them. Uh, but first, I do want to say a couple words about Smithsonian Gardens. You might be wondering, uh, why am I talking about uh, garden photography with Smithsonian Gardens? Uh, most of you know uh, Smithsonian Gardens as uh, the unit responsible for the Smithsonian Gardens and Landscapes on the National Mall in DC. But uh, Smithsonian Gardens uh, also has a collections education and access branch. And uh, we've got three different kinds of collections, living collections, garden artifact, and uh, rather garden furnishings and horticultural artifacts, and also an archival collection. And what we do with those collections then is uh, develop educational programming around them and then push them out to the public, uh, whether it's online education or uh, in person. And AAG specifically, the Archives of American Gardens is the umbrella under which those archival collections fall under uh, at Smithsonian Gardens. And we are tasked with uh, collecting preserving and making available a wide range of uh, documentation related to gardens in the United States, both historic and contemporary. And we were established in 1992, so in Smithsonian years, that's pretty recent. We've got about 40 different collections and we continue to grow. We've got about 10,000 gardens documented in the archives. And uh, specifically, we've got about 4,500 glass lantern slides, so it's a wonderful um, uh, resource. Uh, now, the best way for me to explain what a hand-tinted uh, glass lantern slide is, is to tell you uh, how they start out as. So what you're looking at is a glass lantern slide from the Garden Club of America collection. And now I want you to see what it started out as, as a black and white. So the really amazing thing is when you know that is that every bit of color on the lantern slide on the right had to be applied by hand. Uh, so it was, it was quite, a, um, quite an effort to do that. But uh, not all glass lantern slides were hand tinted. So this is a wonderful example in the collection where we got the black and white version and then we got the hand colored version. And that gives you a sense of uh, just what hand coloring did to a, a slide. But uh, you can imagine how engaging the slide on the right was for a lantern slide lecture, as opposed to the one on the left. But uh, that said, uh, they're uh, important to see together as well. 
Now, uh, what were these Lanton slides used for? Uh, they were used for slide lectures. And uh, glass Lanton slide lectures are just like the PowerPoint presentations of today. Uh, they were meant to educate and um, uh, uh, entertain audiences. And while, uh, and this was mainly late uh, 19th century, early 20th century thereabouts, uh, the heyday of Lanton slide lectures. Uh, the, uh, there were any number of garden books available during this time, to, but to be able to attend a Lanton slide lecture, and especially one with hand-tinted uh, Lanton slides, would have been uh, a really immediate uh, sense for the audience of what the speaker was talking about, and also to share a dialogue uh, with the speaker. Uh, now, a lot of these uh, Lanton slide lectures were accompanied by scripts. So uh, you see a page here uh, from the collection, and these were keyed into specific slides. So these slides were numbered, and the speaker would um, basically recite what was on the page. Uh, the Archives of American Gardens has a couple of uh, these historic uh, Lanton slide scripts available on the Smithsonian Transcription Center. So these typewritten pages were put online and virtual volunteers transcribed them. So now they're available for um, searching online. Now these Lanton slide lectures were meant to be shared uh, from one audience to another. And uh, we have a couple of examples of the uh, boxes in which they were stored. So you'd wanna put them back in the same way uh, uh, just to follow the, the script. And it might remind you of the old uh, Kodak slide carousels, uh, if you remember those. Each slide had its own um, slot in the tray. Now, Magic Lanterns, which about half of you uh, got right in the poll, uh, this was a cottage industry. Uh, uh, this was how lantern slide lectures were given. So think of this as the precursor to the uh, slide carousel slash projector of the 50s, 60s, 70s, into the 90s or so. This is how Lanton slide lectures were given. So uh, this was really popular uh, late 19th century, early 20th century. And uh, there were any number of people giving lectures. So if you were an expert on something, you probably uh, took your lecture on the road. But uh, you could uh, uh, get supplies from manufacturers like Kodak, and uh, both the lantern slides and the magic lantern. So uh, basically, if you were willing to give an investment of uh, time and money, you could, you could do this on your own. Uh, the early uh, magic lanterns or projector, uh, they uh, were, uh, you needed a light source to uh, project the image onto a screen. And the very early ones were uh, powered by a flame, uh, which would have been very dangerous. But uh, subsequent models uh, were electrified, so you can plug them in, and uh, they worked that way, which was much safer. But I was reading recently about uh, Sir Ernest Shackleton's uh, expedition to the South Pole, and he and his men were stuck on the ice, and what they did for entertainment, one of uh, several things, was watch slide lectures. So you know they had to be Lanton slide lectures. So when you say Lanton slides uh, lectures reach the ends of the earth, that was not an exaggeration. That actually happened. Now these Lanton slide lectures, as I say, they were meant to uh, educate and entertain. But just imagine how uh, entertaining or exotic it was for audiences to see gardens that they would never lay eyes on in person. So again, remember all the color was applied, but uh, you've got West Coast Gardens, East Coast Gardens, this one in Maine, and you've got uh, Midwest and Southwest uh, and everything in between. So again, these club, uh, mostly garden clubs were loaning them uh, from club to club across the country. And um, you can see how, uh, as I say, un engaging it would have been for people who would never uh, get to visit these gardens otherwise. These uh, Lanton slide lectures were also uh, uh, educational, and a lot of them advocated for certain things. So the speakers would be educating their audiences uh, on uh, certain environmental 
uh, practices or uh, advocating that they go out and um, and uh, be proactive in the community for certain things. Uh, now, these lectures also uh, harken back to historical gardens, uh, so you might have some historical context uh, leading into an educational lecture, but uh, this is a, uh, a print from the uh, Gardner's Dictionary dating back to the 18th century, and uh, the action, there's a, a page on the left, and then the glass lint and slide version on the right. So again, uh, how engaging uh, the one on the right would have been, your eyes immediately go to that. So color made a big difference. Uh, this is a, uh, an image from a uh, treatise on, uh, on the theory and practice of landscape gardening by Andrew Jackson Downing. So uh, the gardeners were really cognizant of their garden history and uh, they wanted to make sure um, people were aware of that uh, as they were talking about both historic and contemporary gardens. Uh, these lectures might include uh, the equivalent of drone photography today. So uh, you've got aerial photographs. Uh, they might have a plan uh, on the screen so they could sort of analyze what was going on and maybe critique it. Uh, they might even talk about uh, interior decoration and flower arrangements. So there were any number of lectures under the sun and you can tailor it uh, to, uh, to the audience. Uh, and just like today, we've got Zoom and you throw something up in the chat box. Uh, they might have talked about uh, books or, um, or articles uh, that they uh, referred the audience to. Uh, in this case, it was uh, a volume called The Historic Gardens of Virginia. So everything old, everything uh, we have going on today, uh, there's a precedent for it uh, back in the day. Uh, and actually, some of these slide lectures uh, were a means for professionals to gain new uh, clients. And uh, we found that a lot of uh, garden designers and landscape architects and garden photographers were actually lecturers. They gave slide lectures. And it makes sense that they, were, uh, they would uh, show their work so that uh, maybe they would attract clients in the audience there. But uh, we've gone over uh, sort of the purpose of these slide lectures, and now I want to delve into uh, the, what, make, what makes up the, the physical artifact that is a glass lantern slide. Now the um, image on the left, uh, actually I should have mentioned to you, every lantern slide you're seeing in the lecture today comes from uh, the Archives of American Gardens except for this one in the Library of Congress. And the, one I, uh, and I, the reason I show that is I wanted to show you uh, a lot of slides uh, had labels. And you might remember the screen with the slide lecture uh, page. Uh, they might have had symbols. Um, uh, they, uh, these were visual cues too to tell you what was the front of the slide versus what was the back of the slide. Uh, and then this guy over here, this comes from AEG. And um, the, again, uh, you've got uh, maybe a label that identifies it. Here is a, a, a decal with a number, so that would have been keyed into a slide script, uh, which may or may not uh, still exist today. And you can just barely see it, but around the uh, parameter of this slide, you can see a little bit of a, um, a paper frame here. And whenever you see a lantern slide with rounded edges like this, it had one of these paper frames uh, in them, uh, but not all Linton slides had um, these frames. And one thing about this one in particular, I suspect that uh, the tape on this uh, particular slide uh, uh, Become, uh, became unglued over the years. And someone, this is the replacement um, tape because most glass lantern slides have black tape, but I think someone just used um, red as a replacement uh, when they needed it. Now, uh, the anatomy of a glass lantern slide, when I first started working at the archives, I was under the impression that, or I, that what I believed was, it was like a, a, a film sandwich. So you had two layers of glass and a, a piece of film in between. That is not the case. What I learned was uh, it's two layers of glass, one of which has film emulsion laid on top of it. 
And that film emulsion is, is the image uh, in black and white and grayscale. And the emulsion uh, side had just enough tooth to it so that a colorist, and that would be the person who was coloring the slide, that had enough tooth to it so that it would take the translucent paint. And you wanted the paint to be translucent so that you could see the gray scale underneath it. Now, once the uh, lantern slide was, or once the glass plate rather was uh, tinted, you would put a clear uh, uh, sheet of glass over it, and then you would tape those two together. Uh, so uh, that's, that's basically the makeup of a glass lantern slide. Uh, now, one thing you want to look for uh, to just understand, you know, what it took to apply this color, you always look for the gray tones. And that was, uh, that was the area which uh, color was not applied to. So you can see there are uh, bits of, you know, gray and white here. There was no paint applied to these areas, but it does show you where paint was applied and uh, how careful they had to be with these areas here. So uh, there are some lantern slides that are exuberantly colored and um, it shows that it was always an artistic uh, sort of decision uh, to be made about what to color and what not to color. Now, uh, the best colorists made it look easy because you have wonderful ones like this, and then you've got unfortunate ones like this. And it was a case they get A for effort, but you realize that it was not an easy thing to do. And this is another example. They tried hard, but it wasn't as successful. And then this poor guy here. Um, I suspect that there's been a little bit of fading over the years, but at the same time, uh, the, the fields of paint are pretty blotchy. Um, so it's only when you see sort of uh, 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 A for efforts, but you know, C for execution, that you have a better sense of how good a colorist had to be to do their, uh, to do their job and to appreciate the subtleties of the color choices that they made. Uh, now, uh, this is a case where uh, uh, the, the color is beautifully applied, but I want you to keep this in mind. And now we've got this one. So this is the pair of slides that it was like a eureka moment for me when I realized uh, color is not a historic given in these images. And by that I mean uh, they're not necessarily representative of what the actual uh, garden reflected back in the day. So a colorist was working in a studio and they never laid eyes on a particular garden. So unless they might have had some notes from the photographer taking the film, they had to choose for themselves what the, uh, what the image would look like. So this is a case where we've got uh, the very same image, but it's done in two different ways. Now, this could be a nightmare for a garden historian who is trying to restore a historic garden because uh, the color palette they think might be the right one isn't necessarily the case. So if you're a garden historian, you, you need to be aware of this and um, keep that in mind. This is another example of, a, of the same image in the collection uh, done uh, two different ways. And there, uh, it's like those cartoon things, what are the three or four different things in these picture? A couple of things going on. This one is cropped differently, so it's, it's longer than the other one here. Uh, the brown tones are a little bit deeper uh, from one to the other. Uh, there's a little bit more coloring in the ground there than this one. So uh, you can compare glass lantern slides to snowflakes. Uh, no two were alike. Uh, everyone was a little bit different. And uh, my one tangent in this lecture, um, there was a lantern slide process uh, back in the early 20th century that could capture a color in col uh, color film process. And these were called autochromes. And uh, in this case, the pillow that the uh, woman is resting against here was actually orange and the roses on her hat were actually pink. So uh, this was a true uh, way to capture, uh, or this was the way rather to capture, capture true color. 
Now, for a garden historian, these autochromes would be invaluable because these told you uh, the actual colors involved in the landscape. So you can see that uh, set of uh, pink uh, flowers in the distance. Those would have been actually pink. Um, so for restoring a garden, uh, that would be helpful to know. And Cindy, I had a poll. Uh, if you want to throw that up, um, uh, this process of autochromes was so, it sounded so complicated. It was like a Rube Goldberg uh, sort of invention where you had potato starch that was dyed different colors and uh, you had filters and you had the, the filming process and then uh, uh, there was a, a layer of carbon black on the, on the uh, plate to, to seal the colors in. But uh, I would ask the question like, who came up with this? Uh, and it's not, a, it's not a rhetorical question but because we know who it is. So the question I have for the audience is, where was the autochrome process invented? Well, and, they're voting. Uh, your options are England, US, France, and Italy. Exactly. And I think most everybody has voted. Ah, some people are still coming in. I'll give them another minute. It's getting close. Um, OK, yeah. let's call it, Cindy. All right, let's call it. And Paul. There, you can see the results. So the winning uh, choice is England. What was it really? And actually, you might be surprised to learn, uh, this was a process developed in France. Um, here we go. Uh, about a, let's see, about a third of you got the right answer. So exactly. uh, good for you. Uh, this is a, a very learned audience here. And, All right. um, uh, so the Lomier brothers in France invented this process in 1903, and it was first marketed in 1907. Uh, so these are very, this was a very early color uh, technology. And we've got uh, some in the collection, but we have far more uh, hand-tinted lantern slides. So uh, now that you know that uh, you should be a little bit skeptical of colors with uh, each lantern slide you look at, is one more thing you have to be aware of. And that is the lantern slide wasn't always uh, in the proper orientation. So here the house is on the left and this is the exact same image, but here it's on the right. So you realize that uh, that's another thing to take into account that uh, this, uh, just like the color, uh, you, you have to be a little bit suspect with the um, orientation. And uh, Cindy, I have another poll, and I'm sorry they come, it comes so close on the heels of the other one. But the question I have is, the uh, designer of this garden has a direct connection to one of the Smithsonian museums on the National Mall. And uh, we've got four options up there. Uh, so uh, if you want to, uh, uh, vote on what you think the designer of this garden, uh, his direct connection to one of the Smithsonian museums. And they're voting, Joyce, and the answers are coming in quickly. I like doing this. This is really fun. I like to be able to see what the responses are. All right, I think we're over up to 61%. And I know we're on a time limit and I'm watching. Looks like we've got most people, so I'm going to end the poll. And I'm going to share the results. Uh, it's an industry's good guess, but the actual answer is the Freer Gallery. And uh, Charles Platt designed both the Faulkner Farm Garden, which you just saw, and the Freer Gallery of Art in DC. And he was, talk about a Renaissance man, he was an architect, he was a landscape architect, he was an artist, and he was a writer. So he did everything under the sun. But I found it, um, uh, the connections in uh, the design world uh, in early 20th century is, is pretty remarkable. Uh, now, the reason I have this slide up is, if you happen to have uh, some writing in a, uh, an image, then you know for certain if it's oriented the correct way. So you can barely see it here, but this uh, slide has the year uh, the house was built. And uh, while I don't think 
the vast majority of slides were uh, flipped. Uh, it, it is something to keep in mind that it's always a possibility. Uh, now, this is a very uh, early example of photoshopping. And if you think photoshopping is something new, it's not. It's been since the beginning of time. And I want you to take a look at this uh, image and I'll show you where it's been photoshopped, uh, as it were. Uh, so take a good look. Now, uh, just behind the fountain, you can barely see there were three people. I think there are three women that were seated behind the fountain. And whoever the colorist was just took a, a big swath of green and put it right over uh, the, uh, the image. And um, going back, it was in back here. But the colorist was, was uh, using all her skill on the, uh, on the garden elements and deciding not to put too much emphasis on the audience there. Uh, now, the one, or one of the major problems with the glass lantern slide is just that, uh, they're glass. Uh, so they will break if you drop them. And uh, that, uh, there's no repairing it if, if the break happens on the emulsion side. Uh, so if you remember back to the diagram I had, there's the, uh, the, the glass plate with the emulsion on it, and then the, uh, the clear uh, glass plate that covers it. If the clear glass plate uh, breaks, you can replace it. But if the emulsion side breaks, you just need to leave it in place. Uh, there's really no good way to um, repair it. And the only saving grace is that the, uh, the tape that holding those two together, it, uh, it, hold it, it holds it in register, so it's not gonna get any worse. But this is a case where, uh, and look for the fracture lines too, you'll see them uh, with plates and you'll know that they've been broken over the years. But this is a case where the emulsion uh, was um, affected by that, uh, that break along the line there. Uh, so uh, that's sort of going over the, the uh, physicality and um, sort of the makeup of, of glass lantern slides. Now uh, I'm going to dive further into what information the lantern slides provide as an artifact. And uh, you'll recall a couple of the slides early on that had labels on their side that uh, might have indicated uh, where they were located or the date. Uh, the AAG has hundreds of examples of lantern slides that we have absolutely no idea where they're located or who the owner was or what the date is. And this, uh, this is an example of that. Uh, it's a handsome image, but we have really no clues to go on uh, as to its identification. This is a case where uh, uh, there's information to be had in it. Even though we don't know where it was located um, or when it was taken, uh, there are historians out there that are historians of, of uh, clothing, and they could probably uh, get this uh, image, uh, triangulate this image down to a, a decade or so. Now, lantern slides, uh, the sort of the, the lifespan of the modern lantern slide was roughly 1850s to roughly 1950s. And the heyday was uh, late uh, 19th, early 20th century. Most of AAG's images date from uh, about 1900 to about 1935 or so. Uh, I would put this particular image probably in the 1900 to 1910 range. Um, but those are the clues you look for. Uh, if there's anything to be had, you're, you're gonna try to uh, find it there. Sorry about that. Um, this image, even though we know uh, where it was taken and when, I put it on there to show that uh, there are automobile historians are out there that if you didn't know when the date was, they could probably get you pretty close to a certain date uh, there. And what I found intriguing about this image, you can't see it on the screen, but uh, the man's overalls, it has a Ford Motors uh, company patch on it. And if I was a researcher, I'd be curious if uh, Ford Motors had a subsidiary down in Mexico City and uh, go from there and try to triangulate like a date um, there. This image, uh, uh, we found a publication this uh, glass lantern slide was published in. So we, uh, the publication dated from 1925. So we know the image had to be taken before then. 
So uh, it's these sort of breadcrumbs that you follow to, uh, to find if, if you can uh, glean any more information about a um, particular image. This one, we know where it's located and know uh, when it was uh, taken, but we don't know a specific uh, address or a client. Uh, so uh, someone from Ridgewood, New Jersey might recognize it or the Ridgewood Historical Society. So it's things like that. Sometimes there are um, things to follow up on. And uh, one thing about this image too, it reminds me that if there's one thing that the uh, Lanton Slide Collection at AEG is a little bit lacking in, it's the everyday garden. Uh, a lot of the images in the collection are high-end gardens and uh, very Tony gardens of the day. So uh, it costs money to get these uh, Lanton Slides made and to uh, have them colored. So the everyday gardener probably uh, wouldn't have them made. So, uh, that said, we do have some wonderful examples of everyday gardens in the uh, collection. And uh, this one I love because it shows uh, what a, a tremendous job this uh, man would have had uh, mowing the lawn with a hand mower. And uh, just so you know, now that you're educated, any of these black uh, lines here are fracture lines. So this uh, Lanton slide has been broken over the years. Uh, this uh, talk about everyday gardens, we've, we got a wonderful uh, donation in a few years back uh, that had uh, a handful of images uh, showing school gardens from early 20th century. And this would have been around the time of the City Beautiful movement um, when uh, urban planners were looking into how to uh, make uh, cities more beautiful. So this is an invaluable resource here. Um, so I want to transition over in my concluding remarks just to a little about uh, this garden, uh, or rather the Lanton Slides and the uh, Archives of American Gardens. And uh, literally the uh, we received uh, slides over the years in shoeboxes. Uh, people have found them, you know, in their basements or closets and donated them. And um, uh, so what uh, staff have done over the years, they have uh, inventoried and cataloged those. Uh, we've rehoused the images. So this is what's going on in the middle image here. Uh, we put them in uh, paper envelopes. Uh, they have four flaps on them and they're uh, they're custom sized, so they're exactly the size of the uh, land slides. And in this way, this paper envelope uh, helps keep the images from getting scratched. And we put the image number here on the uh, envelope so that we don't have to keep opening up the envelope to find out what we're looking at. We just have uh, uh, the slides there. And this image is how the slides are uh, now. So they go from, you know, they might have been in a um, uh, shoebox until how they are uh, housed in the archives. And they're in custom boxes in the envelopes. There might be, I'm gonna say about 50 uh, slides to a box. And these boxes get incredibly heavy because it's all glass. And when you think of it, uh, that's a lot of uh, weight there. And uh, you also don't want big boxes of these because uh, you never want to have the situation you drop a box, but just in case you ever do, that the whole collection is not broken. You know, you've, you've got an isolated uh, number of um, plates here. And for anyone asking the question, we haven't broken any plates uh, during my tenure here. So uh, AAG uh, has also uh, digitized uh, the Lanton slides. Uh, the one on the left is from a, a late, uh, late 80s, early 90s uh, initiative. And at the time, this was cutting edge. So uh, they look great at the time, but over the years, uh, this just wasn't doing it for us. So we secured a Smithsonian grant to redigitize the land slides. And uh, you can see the difference uh, on the right, um, how subtle the colors are here. So uh, we're very fortunate that the land slide collection is now digitized. And it's all available online on the Smithsonian uh, Collection Search Center. So you can search for uh, not only AEG Lanton slides, but uh, Lanton slides across the uh, many Smithsonian units and archives. And uh, the great thing about uh, Lanton slides is we never know how they're going to be used. Uh, this is an example of um, we were contacted by an author. He was writing a biography on 
uh, David Adler, who was a, uh, an architect in the Midwest. And the researcher could have cared less about the garden elements of this slide. He was only interested in the, the house that David Adler designed. So um, this slide made it onto the cover of the book here. Uh, again, we never know how uh, the collection is going to be used. Uh, my colleague had a query once from a researcher. They did not care the least about the garden. They were interested in the piece of sculpture in the garden. And it wasn't this particular piece, but it shows you that uh, you think you might uh, have an audience strictly uh, interested in garden history, and you realize there are many, many um, ways that these images can be used. Uh, this, uh, and by that, uh, we we get contacted by um, scholars and garden historians who are restoring gardens, uh, students, uh, lecturers, educators, uh, writers, uh, everything under the sun. We never know uh, what the next uh, research uh, query is going to be. Uh, and that what, ma what makes it so interesting. And when I was putting this lecture together, I realized that this was used on the cover of Horticulture Magazine a few years back, celebrating its centennial. And the, uh, this uh, bush here, the Y-shaped bush, is on the right, but it's on the left here. So somewhere along the way, uh, it was flipped, and a researcher would have to figure out which is the right orientation uh, in this case. And uh, I'll say also that the Lanton Slide collection is like a who's who of heavy hitters in the 20th century. So uh, it's a wonderful resource. Cyrus McCormick, he was the president of International Harvester, and just about every Lanton Slide in the collection has a story to tell. So uh, just uh, ending up, I want to give you a couple of books if you're interested in this topic. Uh, there are some wonderful books out there. Uh, Golden Age of American Gardens. Uh, this is like the Bible for AEG. This book was written by Matt Griswold and Eleanor Weller. And uh, it features scores of Linton slides from the uh, Garden Club of America collection in uh, this volume. And I just want to give a shout out to Eleanor Weller. Uh, she is a member of the Garden Club of America who uh, wrangled these or uh, tracked these slides down in the uh, 1980s. And this was pre-internet, pre-email. Pre so she was writing letters. She was making phone calls. She was contacting all these um, Garden Club of America clubs and asking them to, um, to donate their images to the GCA. So uh, it was a wonderful initiative, and they've since made their way to the Smithsonian, to the AAG. Newport and Flower was written about a decade ago, and uh, it's a second, the second edition. And the second edition took Lanton slides from the GCA collection, age, and they juxtapose it uh, to uh, slides, uh, contemporary uh, images of the same garden. Uh, so you see a before and after view. And uh, sorry, Gardens for a Beautiful America. Uh, this was uh, a book written uh, about five or six years ago by Sam Waters. He and he uh, talks about the career of the garden for, uh, or the photographer Francis Benjamin Johnston. And uh, she specialized in garden photography, but she did a lot as well. She did uh, architectural photography and portraits and everything else. She's very prolific. And her uh, Lanton slides ended up at the Library of Congress. Uh, so that is a wonderful resource. All of her Lanton slides have been digitized as well. So that's another resource to uh, look into. So uh, I want to end uh, my talk by uh, uh, just saying uh, the reason I, I chose this um, background was it re reminds me of the uh, brushes uh, that a colorist would have used, a paintbrush. Uh, and we have those anonymous uh, colorists to thank for these beautiful images. And many of them were uh, women uh, working in uh, the photo studios. But uh, I, uh, you know, we have them to thank for making a beautiful resource. We have the many uh, garden clubs, uh, particularly the Garden Club of America, uh, that were willing to uh, give up their land and slide collections and uh, donate them for the greater good. Uh, for everyone to, uh, to share and enjoy. Uh, so there are many, many people to uh, thank, but, um, uh, and I, I thank you as well for uh, listening to this lecture. 
I hope you uh, take away some new knowledge and uh, have a better appreciation for um, the uh, landslide collections at the Archives of American Gardens. So thank you. Joyce, thank you. That was, and I'm gonna quote someone that just put on, you are fantastic. Thank you for a great lecture. And I thank agree. You. That was a wonderful, wonderful uh, description, background information, everything on gla glass lantern slides. It was, I, I even learned a thing or two. And after these many years, you continue to surprise me with your knowledge. So thank, thank you, you for that. I once um, uh, told colleagues I'm much uh, more comfortable with pay, uh, words on a page than words on a stage like this. But in this case, I love the Lanton Slide collection so much that it, it just it just comes out. Um, so, we were we we're you. glad that you were uh, enthusiastic and share the knowledge with us. Thank you. And for all of these, you should see all the questions that have been asked. So I just want to let the audience know that we probably won't get to all the questions today, but we will answer your questions. After this presentation, we whip this away and we close caption it and we put together a resource page and everything will be posted up on our website sometime next week once we get the closed captions in place. But I want to uh, start with some of them. And, and one of the ones that I thought was really good to answer, is there a fee to use any of these slides? If you want to do a book or a magazine, uh, do Archives of American Gardens charge a fee? There are use fees. You can uh, uh, get the images uh, off the internet, you know, for a fair use application, which would be if you're giving a, a garden lecture or something. But if it, uh, if it goes into um, a publication or commercial use, we do charge a minimal uh, use fee for that. But anyone, uh, you know, if they just want some inspiration at home or something, they can certainly um, just harvest the images uh, for themselves. Okay, and uh, you would want to contact every um, catalog record uh, on online has information about contacting AAG if you need to. Okay, that's going to be another lecture we'll have to do is how do you find the images on SOVA or on collection search database because that's always a trick to it too. But do we have the largest collection of glass lantern slides in the no, United States? There are, there, are there are collections all over the place and the Library of Congress, like I say, the, uh, the Francis Benjamin Johnston, but uh, within the Smithsonian, uh, you've got pockets of lantern slides. So you can even pick up uh, Lanton slides on uh, eBay uh, today. They're still out there. Uh, uh, they uh, people still have them in their closets and uh, attics and basements. So they're still out there. But I don't know what the largest collection is. But uh, we're not. We're not it. Yeah, I, and that's a good pitch too. If you're cleaning up during this pandemic and you find a collection of glass lantern slides, if they are especially related to gardening, please let us know. Email us at gardens, uh, .s, or gardens at si.edu uh, and Joyce will be glad to have a conversation with you. Uh, and if we can't use them, she'll also help you out finding a good home for it. Don't just throw it out. You're throwing yeah, out there's history. always a good home for uh, historic materials. Yes, exactly. So we're interested in gardens and, and gardening, but other people are interested in many other topics in glass lantern slides. But I, I want to find out uh, more about the uh, industry, I will say, of tinting the glass lantern slides. Is this something that was an organized industry? Were these freelancers? How, how did they do this and who were they? How well were they paid? Um, right. And again, I, I'm, I'm qualifying my remarks to say I'm not a uh, photo historian, but what I understand is uh, you would have these photo studios that were generating photographs and lantern slides and um, maybe doing some printing on the side or something. And they might have a, a few people uh, in a unit uh, do, doing the coloring. Uh, so I don't know... Uh, you know, whether people would do this work at home, but I have a sense that they were hired uh, to do it uh, for photo studios. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, you know, I, I think it speaks to sort of how anonymous history can become over the years. Uh, this would have been a huge thing in the early 20th century, but we don't know a whole lot about it now. Mm -hmm. I, just so that we can see you speaking a little bit closer, could you stop sharing and then we'll, they'll see both of our 
our heads, but your, your, your head in particular, uh, so they can do that. But I, I am, the women that did this, uh, were they well paid? W was your talent uh, uh, measured by the amount you would have to pay someone? Uh, to I would that? imagine that, uh, no doubt, it, it was on a, a per unit uh, basis that uh, uh, you were paid by the plate. And uh, you'll remember the images that showed the, uh, they tried hard, but it, it wasn't very good. So there was probably also a scale of the best uh, colorists, you know, would, would, might be paid a little bit more. And I found out recently that not all colored lantern slides were done by hand. And that makes sense because these lantern slide lectures would have been packaged for schools or you know anything under the sun and that's when they just had to churn them out mm -hmm. so they were sort of doing this uh industrial scale tinting you know whether it was a machine or something but uh so not all colored slides are hand tinted but they uh so they might have been uh done automatically yeah, I don't know if anybody picked up that one ad that you showed that for a complete outfit was $71.30, and that included the screen that you showed uh, your lantern slides on. So yes, and, and you got a, a discount or it included war slides. So I think that part of that kit had would be very interesting to have at this yeah. point. And in fact, I read one of the uh, collections, uh, the J. Horace McFarlane collection in AEG, his company would package uh, slide lectures for the troops over in World War I over in Europe. Uh, so uh, this was just, this was the television of its day, quite frankly. This was how people learned about uh, topics. Uh, it could be anything from science to history to literature to anything under the sun. It wasn't just garden lectures. Uh, uh -huh. It was absolutely everything. Yeah, and, and somebody asked how heavy were these, and I what, I always make the comparison that I always used to cry when I would lecture and I would drop a carousel of slides. I can't imagine what it would be like uh, to drop this on the way uh, overseas to go uh, yeah. be like the early USO. That uh, box I showed you earlier, those have slots in them, so that helped the slides uh, keep them in register that they weren't sloshing around. So mm -hmm. uh, people uh, tried to take care of them when they had them, but that said, it was a leap of faith to either put them in the mail or, or send them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm glad that I, I didn't have to do that at any point. Uh, another question came in, and this is something we're very interested in. Someone wanted to know if we had a collection of African-American uh, gardens, uh, designers. Uh, that's something that we're recruiting that we'd like to find more. Is that correct? We're definitely uh, uh, looking for ways to fill in gaps in the collection. and. While we've relied a lot on donors contacting us, uh, we're, we're trying to make um, progress in reaching out to people to donate. So absolutely, there are gaps in the collection that we want to fill, and we don't have anything specifically related to African-American designers, uh, but we've got a couple of examples of uh, African-American gardens in the uh, collection, but by no means uh, do we have enough. Mm -hmm. So we need the help out there to do. find out some more of those so we can really augment the collection and really tell the true story uh, of American gardens uh, back in that time period. So another question, uh, were the paper frames around the slides, were they there to protect? What, why were they there? Why are the paper frames? So you had that little bit of a paper frame with the rounded mm -hmm. edges. It was just meant to uh, sort of make it attractive a bit. Uh, there's something about having those rounded edges that made it ethereal almost. It was floating uh, as opposed to a square edge. And um, the tape that went around it was black, uh, was like a black uh, adhesive, uh, it was tape uh, that sealed the, um, uh, the two pieces of glass together. Okay, that's, that's good to know because I would hold my uh, little slides by those paper ed edges. So maybe- That's, that's a great thought, Cindy. Don't know. Oh, yeah, that was a good question. This one I'm going to answer because people are asking about individual gardens and the, uh, do we have slides of those individual gardens? And there have been a bunch that in Missouri, a couple other places. So if people want to research a specific garden, 
they can first look online to be able to look at the collections uh, search center that we have that the, we shared the link with in our chat box. But also if they really want to know about a specific garden, please email us. We'd be glad to do the research and look and help you out. Uh, it will take us a while because all, are all the collections education and access crew uh, department are working at home. Uh, so we are teleworking and access to original materials isn't as quick as what it would be if we were in the office. But please email us, we'll work on it as, as best as we can and as quickly as we can. So that's for all of you that are wondering what we have in our collection and, and how they would have access to it. That'd be A great. lot's digitized and available online, but uh, there are portions that are not. So it's always mm -hmm. worth an uh, 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 email to us to find out. Mm -hmm. And then somebody remarked that we're like we're like detectives, and I totally agree with that. T tell us about how do you find some of those mystery gardens and, and put two and two together? We, we have a great social media presence, and uh, they've gone out um, and uh, Mystery Mondays, you know, sort of thing to throw up an image. And, and uh, if anyone recognizes it, uh, we've had uh, some great success. You know, there's always one or two out there, uh, people that uh, recognize these things. So. We have more luck with uh, with images that have like uh, architectural elements in them, whether it's a home or a building, uh, as opposed to just an anonymous landscape. Those uh, are probably going to remain anonymous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, but it is fun. And we do have some great volunteers that work with us that are fabulous detectives that really help us out. Uh, I'm appreciative for it. So. Going back to how did we make these slides now available online? So the differences between how we scan them to begin with uh, and what is the process that we do now? And I know I've seen it. So tell, I think people would be amazed at what we do. So there's one method that uh, you get a flatbed scanner and you scan each of them. And that, uh, because of the resolution we were going for, it was literally like a five minute scan. It just sort of went, it crept over. We have since um, hired uh, digitization contractors to come on site and digitize things. So they have a setup, they've got a light box. They put each um, slide down on the light box and photograph it and digitize it and then we get a digital file from it. So that is a much faster um, process. We've been very fortunate to find uh, contractors who are willing to come on site to do that because of the fragile nature of the plates. We don't want to send them off site um, and have them out of our uh, purview. Yeah, and it's a big camera. It's an amazingly sized camera that actually takes pictures of the pictures and it gives you better resolution than we ever have in any That's scan. just it. The resolution is incredible. And uh, what you see on what, what's available online on the uh, Smithsonian online catalog, uh, they're not even the masters. Uh, we've got uh, the masters that are, are uh, higher resolution. Mm. Incredible. Uh, digitization really has helped us share this information and we're lo really looking forward to see what other images will be able to capture and information we'll be able to capture. And I, before we go, because we have like two more minutes, uh, we do have another method for uh, gathering information about America's gardens. And it's a little bit easier than what uh, Joyce is doing in, in, with her group. And that's uh, called Community of Gardens. And it's a website that we have online that we really like to hear more about the everyday gardens that are out there. Uh, you can send us images, you can send us stories. And so we've been collecting stories for a number of years. And if you have a garden story you'd love to share with us, a garden image that you'd love to share with us, and they're not glass lantern slides, they're just everyday garden stories, please go on the Community of Gardens website or Smithsonian Gardens website, you can get there to Community of Gardens. And that is how we're actively gathering uh, some of these news stories. So we'd appreciate your help. Uh, to be able to keep track of the trends of America's gardens. So thank you. I'm looking to see if there was any one more question that we should really address. Ah, what is the uh, system that we use to catalog these uh, glass lantern slides? So you can find them. Uh, the uh, AEG follows uh, standards uh, in the archival world. So uh, we have a, um, an automated program uh, that the Smithsonian uh, maintains. Uh, it's A-space specifically, but 
uh, we follow all the standards out there that uh, we use uh, certain terms so that you can find them uh, searching. Great. Uh, and this one, uh, do we, uh, couldn't the colorist tell which side was which, which was the front of the slide, which was the back of the slide you because know, of the emulsion? The, the colorist would inherit a plate that had the emulsion on it already. So they, it would be, by the time it got to the colorist, they, they had no uh, bearing on it. It was the person who printed out the plates. Ah, so it wasn't the colorist making the mistake in the orientation. Right. It was whoever was putting the emulsion on. Ah, that's, yes. a good, that's a good tip. So, well, it is one o'clock. It went past so quickly. Thank you so much for all this information. And as I said before, uh, we'll get to some of the questions that we didn't answer in this talk. Uh, we will be glad to answer them. We do make a resource page and that will be available on our website, gardens.si.edu sometime next week. Uh, there's only five of us that are in the department, so it takes us a while to get everything done. And I don't do any of the work, Joyce does it. Um, so um, we, will, we will have that up and ready for you to go. So thank you once again Thanks, for everyone. joining us. Thank you, Joyce, for a fabulous presentation. And thank you to everyone in the audience for wanting to learn more about Let's Talk Gardens. See you next week. Thanks, Bye. everyone.